Well, let me share with you uh, my favorite picture so far from the Mars Curiosity lander. And I say so far because uh, this picture was taken on Sol uh, 34, the 34th day on Mars. Right now, it's a little bit before noon on the 67th day on Mars for this rover. It's designed to operate for a full Martian year, which is almost two Earth years, so there's a lot more to come. Now, this is all 67 today. For some perspective, the rover that we launched in 2004, Opportunity, it had a twin named Spirit, which is no longer oper uh, operating, but Opportunity is. Uh, right now, it's late in the evening on Sol 3100. Just to give you some perspective, the warranty ran out on Sol 90. So we're 3,010 days past the warranty. So this could go on for a very, very long time. This is my favorite picture so far. This was taken by a camera at the end of the arm on the rover. Uh, the rover is called the Mars Science Laboratory. Its name is Curiosity. It was actually a student contest, the winner that actually named the rover and wrote an excellent essay about that. The arm, it's actually a left-handed rover, so it's got a shoulder, elbow, and wrist, and at the end is a turret that includes something called the Mars Hand Lens Imager. And this picture was taken where the arm was reached down below, looking back underneath the rover. So you see the wheels here, three of the wheels, it's sitting on the surface of Mars and off in the distance of the foothills of Mount Sharp, which is our ultimate destination. Now, this rover is on one heck of a journey. It's on an interplanetary journey, and it has a purpose. Actually, the rover is an inanimate object. It has no purpose. The purpose is ours, and we're projecting through the rover. So this rover right here, its purpose is, or our purpose through the rover, is to identify regions of habitability on Mars. So we've been following the water, trying to get the history of water on Mars. Now we're looking to see, could life have gotten started on Mars in the past, and may it still be there? All this, this is actually looking at habitable environments, not specifically looking for little green men or really little green microbes. So this rover is about the size of a, of a car. So it's a very large rover, very capable rover. And as you look at this, just remember two things. One, it was built in Southern California. Yeah, there you go. And as taxpayers, this is ours. So we're all collectively contributing to this. So in one sense, the picture itself is astounding, and it's available on the internet. You shouldn't have any problem finding it if you go looking for it. This is a mechanical object, incredibly sophisticated, sitting on the surface of another planetary body. This is actually the fourth rover that's gone to Mars and the seventh time we landed on Mars. That should be a source of collective pride for the human race. Now, how did this happen? How did this astounding technological achievement take place? How, how can we engage in these journeys and, and uh, why do we have purposes like this to project out? Well, two things. First of all, human beings are fundamentally curious. So one of the biggest questions is whether there's life elsewhere in the universe. And we used to think of the Goldilocks zone, so kind of between Venus and Mars where it's not too hot and it's not too cold, it's just right, and here we are. Well, we're expanding that very dramatically, both in our solar system, looking at habitable environments where we find fresh water. Jupiter's moon Europa has a salty liquid water ocean below an ice crust. There's ice geysers on one of Saturn's moons called Enceladus, and more on a moon called Triton around Neptune. So we're expanding our view. But more importantly, we're finding evidence of planets around other stars. Earth-like planets around sun-like stars in the wrong orbits right now, but eventually we'll find analogs to Earth. And we're asking the question, is there life elsewhere in the universe? Either the universe has life in only one place, and we're it, or the universe is teeming with life in planets around stars, around galaxies, throughout the universe. Either one of those is incredibly profound, and we don't know which one it is. So how is it that we come to engage in this kind of activity? And curiosity is as good a, an explanation as any. This is the result of millions of correct decisions made by highly motivated, talented, skilled, intrinsically motivated individuals who believe that asking and finding the technological means to answer really, really big questions is worthwhile. And we have the capability to do that. These people exist. In the case of engineers and scientists, we have rovers. In case of any other quest, there are certainly people around who are asking and answering the, uh, these important questions. So how did our education system come to be able to do these kinds of things? Now, to flashback, I've been at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for about uh, 23 years. Before that, I was a high school science teacher. When I got to JPL in 1990, I thought my job was to create the next generation of scientists and engineers. Well, what happened in the mid-1990s? By some measures, Southern California alone lost between 150 and 200,000 aerospace jobs. Some of you in the audience might have felt that personally. So we have aerospace in Southern California, but it's not what it used to be. 
So I didn't think I could go in front of a classroom of fifth and sixth graders with a straight face and say, study hard, take math and science, there's a great for career for you ahead in aerospace. Because maybe there was and maybe there wasn't. So I satisfied myself that for the students that were truly interested and really adept at this kind of information, they would pursue these careers and that JPL and the aerospace companies and the nation would have the workforce that it would need. And to some extent, supply and demand shifts back and forth. But what about everybody else in the room? What about all those other students? Well, the likelihood is that few, if any, of the students I was talking to would actually come and take on these careers. But every single one of them was going to become a citizen, or was, in fact, a citizen. And most of them, in fact, should be or would be voting. Voting on what? Well, take an issue that's on the ballot today that doesn't have some sort of technological impact. So we've been asked to decide questions, or will be, on labeling for genetically engineered foods, high-speed rail, clean air, clean water, climate change, which at GPL we call global warming, and things that have an impact where we are casting votes where there is an aspect to it that is not just sort of intuitive. You can't look at the ballot measure and snap to a conclusion because, aha, I have an opinion about that. I saw a television ad. So what we need instead, and I think Jeffersonian democracy almost insists on it, is that we have a citizenry that has enough scientific and technological knowledge not to be able to teach physics in high school, but to be able to look at a question and say, well, what am I seeing? What am I hearing? What am I reading? How can I put this together into a coherent view? And then vote or act on that particular issue. So how is the school system doing in terms of preparing students for that? Well, for the last 10 years, under the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, otherwise known as No Child Left Behind, also known as No Child Left Untested, No Teacher Left Unaccused, we've had a system where accountability has narrowed down to English language arts and mathematics. I've got nothing wrong with those two things, except that the emphasis in many schools has been, don't let me catch you, any, catch you teaching anything that doesn't contribute to those test scores. Those are high-stakes sco scores. The district, the school, the veritable life of the principal depends on those scores. And you have targets. You're supposed to be growing towards those targets. Ideally, everyone will meet those targets. So far, it hasn't quite worked out that way. So we end up with students that are learning math as well, largely in the way that they have over history. There's nothing really special going on there. I mean, there are new math. I, I, I don't mean to, to bemoan the teaching of mathematics, but mathematics is not quite like science in terms of new discovery, the way it occurs. But really, my quarrel is a little bit more with English language arts, where the readers that the students have been using are industrial, for lack of a better word, in terms of the chapter and verse and what they're reading. They're reading as a skill, but they're not reading about anything. Occasionally, we look into the, uh, the readers and say, well, they're, they're reading, there's a section about Galileo. There's got to be some leverage to talk about astronomy in there. And then we really read it and go, oh my gosh, you know, there's nothing here to use. So my problem is that students are learning to read, but they're reading because they have to. They're not reading for pleasure. They're not reading for fun. So students aren't pleasure reading, which means they're not reading science fiction, which means they're not developing an expectation that I think I did. So 2001 A Space Odyssey, both the book and the movie, and other people's Star Wars, various things throughout people's careers have an influence in terms of what they read or believe. Students today are not building a sense that they belong on Mars, that going to live on Mars, that a colony on Mars is not just something that we could do one day if you did this, that, and the other, but it's an inevitable pathway for humanity. I'm concerned that students today aren't looking in the horizons, don't extend beyond the horizons to that extent. Therefore, why would they be thinking about that? Why would they take value in something like this? Why would they go into science and engineering? Or why would they vote for things like this? Every once in a while, I'm amazed we even have a space program, considering the way the uh, political winds blow back and forth. Now, I think we've seen, for the people that stayed up late to watch the Curiosity landing, for people that went outside of their homes and businesses to see the Endeavor fly around Los Angeles or join the pathway as it was dragged from the airport to the California Science Center, I think there's substantial evidence that people have a, deal of, a great deal of enthusiasm for this kind of thing, but we haven't marshaled it within the schools. My suggestion is that we not only integrate where we not are just teaching English and language arts because, and math because the test scores are there, but that we treat every subject as necessary to build a whole student as we graduate them, because we don't yet know what their talent's going to be. Now, it is possible for teachers to identify talent where it resides and nurture it. I don't think you can teach talent. You can't take a student and make them talented. You can make them skilled. But you need to be able to find students that are talented and be able to nurture that talent 
and mentor them so that they can go someplace like this, or the fine arts, or the social studies, whatever it might be. And that our system now, because of the way it handles students and processes them through, is not good at doing that and identifying individual talents. So let me just wrap up with one thought here. At JPL, kind of thinking about hiring and so on, JPL is committed to early career hires because all the rest of us are getting older. Students are going to be hired out of college as fresh outs for their first job because we happen to need a thermal engineer or a structures person or something like that. But that job is going to end. The engineering jobs that were involved with creating this rover ended. So what happens to those people? They go on to something else. And very often, it's not in the field they were hired for. Very often, they were hired to do one thing, but a job opened someplace else. But if they did a good job on their first project, then the project manager knows about them and wants them, whether they know what it is that they can do or not. So they want them because they know they're talented and that they've learned how to learn and they're capable of being adaptable. And so the highest level of, uh, of organism at JPL, in my view, is the project manager. Because everybody below and everybody below, above is working for their success because they're responsible for actually flying and managing these missions. And who are the project managers? Doesn't matter what their engineering or science degree was, doesn't matter what their first job was, they've had a bunch of jobs and for almost all of them, they didn't know what that job was when they started it. So they've got to be flexible, they've got to be creative. In order to be that, they first have to be mentored, and then before that, they have to have a horizon. They have to have some sense of what their purpose is in order to even engage in that journey. Oh, by the way, I happen to bring a prop up here. This right here is actually a full-size flight spare of one of those wheels there. In fact, there's a tag on it here, and this is serial number 007. You want to guess where 001 through 6 are? <laughs> so this right here is a milled piece of aluminum. It's got a titanium flexure axle, axle system here. It sheds rocks. It handles, uh, uh, it handles uh, thermal changes day and night. It is part of a suspension system. It also has a system that allows us to stamp into the ground as the wheels turn so we can do wheel odometry as, it, as we go by. Uh, it's just a coincidence that it spells out JPL in Morse code. But, uh, <laughs> There is no single correct answer for how to build a wheel on the planet Mars for a rover that's going to Mars. So this here, maybe not millions, but certainly dozens if not hundreds of thoughtful and correct decisions that were made in order to design a system that could function in this environment and in fact is certainly doing that. Thank you.